Yes? Um, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Isabella Hung. And today we have a presentation from Media Math. Uh, we have Will and Jacob, who are kindly with us today, from Media Math. Uh, Will, who's the CTO, and Jacob, who is the Chief Production Officer. Product Officer, thanks. Um, but they're here today to talk to us about Media Math, uh, give us a little bit of background about the company, um, as well as, you know, mostly just how it became so successful, how it still uh, stays competitive with uh, the competition currently. Um, so, to start, we have Jacob. Can you guys hear me? Ooh. Good morning. Um, who's here from, who, who here is an engineering major? And who here is a non-engineering major? Two. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So um, I, uh, my name's Jacob. Uh, I run the product team at MediaMath. Um, the way that technology is structured at MediaMath, the teams, are that um, Will, uh, Will's our CTO. Um, he's responsible for architecture. He's sitting right there. You'll hear from him in a second. Don't worry. Um, uh, Steve, uh, we work with a guy named Steve who runs our engineering teams. And then um, I run our product teams. And we work together to build great stuff. Um, I've been at MediaMath for three years. Uh, I've been in the digital advertising space for about 20. Um, I, um, I started in finance. I thought that's what I wanted to do with my career, um, and I was really wrong. Um, I didn't like that very much. Uh, I loved solving problems. I loved the systems that um, uh, trading enables, and that's what attracted me to this space, uh, because in it I found a really cool marketplace where we're transacting billions of requests and responses in real time. Um, it was really exciting for me to see that in action, and so that's why I joined this funny industry called online advertising, digital advertising. Um, yeah, so I'm going to focus a little bit more on the business context. And why we do that at MediaMath is that we generally, when we work really well, product and engineering, Will and I partner really well together. Um, it's my job and my team's job in product to really articulate the business problem clearly and then co collaborate really closely with the amazing engineers we have at MediaMath to build the best solution. Um, and so I'm going to tee it up for Will. I'm going to talk a little bit about the business, the context, et cetera, and then we'll get into the technology. I know you guys like to get pretty technical. Is that OK? All right, cool. Lots of nods. Um, so, um, so this is the problem. Do you, have you guys seen this quote before? Anybody? Good. We're so sick of this quote because <laughs> this is the quote that is the thing that obsesses all of us. Um, John Wanamaker, I think he was born in 1838. He died in 1922. So this quote was sometime between the time that he was born and he died. I'm not exactly sure when it was. And so you could probably say that it's about 100 years ago. So over 100 years ago, a guy said this. And this is the motivating problem that we try to solve, which is, Marketers are trying to reach customers to give them relevant messages, um, and we're really trying to figure out what's working. And interestingly enough, we haven't totally solved the problem, although uh, the internet, digital technology that Will's going to talk about a bit um, have really helped us get a lot closer. Um, so like I said, this is something that we really obsess about. Every day we talk about um, what are the problems uh, that we're trying to solve, how do we know if our client's spend is actually working, um, how do we actually know what working means? It's actually surprising how complicated that question is. Um, but this, uh, our space represents, you'll see some market sizing slides in a second, represents about um, a trillion dollars. That's the total addressable market across all of advertising. It's about 1% of our total GDP in the US. So it's a big, it's a big thing for us to try to solve for. So it's a, um, as opposed to thinking of this as like a way to make a lot of money, we think of this also as a problem that is at a large scale that we need to solve um, with smart people and technology. So who is MediaMath? That's probably still a question. Have you guys uh, uh, dug into who we are yet? Anybody do some background research? A couple nods. Is this early for undergrads? <laughs> Does it feel like an early, is this the first thing you've done today? No? All right. Um, who, my wife told me that she was like, it's 10.30, it's going to be too early for these guys. And I, I, was, I was like, I don't think that's <laughs> anymore. 
Um, so anyway, we're a global technology company, um, uh, which, which uh, means that we operate in uh, a lot of different countries around the world. Uh, we have a lot of different data centers around the world, so we operate at global scale. Uh, we're an innovator. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. Um, we work with big clients, uh, P&G, largest marketer on the planet, um, Dell, Jet, which was acquired by Walmart, um, AT&T, IBM, Uber, and more. These guys hire us to help solve some problems, and I'll walk you through some of the problems that we're solving for them. Um, we license them our platform and teach them how to use it to help them accomplish their digital marketing objectives. So we have a platform Will and I built um, that allows them to do that. They log in to a GUI. We have robust APIs. Um, they either build on top of our APIs or they use our user interface, um, and we charge them on a, you know, we sign multi-year contracts with them, so they license software from us. We also work with the largest agencies in the world. Um, so these are some examples of big holding company agencies. There are about half a dozen of those. Um, they are, uh, they control an enormous amount of advertising budget, and more and more, their role is shifting, um, and they are looking for ways to deliver innovative technology solutions to their own clients, and so we see them as partners, um, and we have really great deep partnerships with a lot of them. Um, MediaMath itself, we have about 800 employees, 40% uh, in tech, that's all cross product and engineering. Um, obviously, we're here, uh, partly because we're hiring very aggressively right now. We're based on Four World Trade downtown, beautiful offices, two floors, 45, 46. I don't want to steal too much of Megan's thunder, um, but we're really excited to talk to you guys about that. Um, we have 16 offices around the world. Um, we have totally about uh, 9,500 uh, 9, advertisers in our stable of clients, um, and so we uh, really need to think about how to solve problems in a class at, at the class level um, and at a very large scale to enable them to do what they need to do. And we process a lot of data um, and uh, we do a lot of really interesting things with that data, which um, Will's going to talk to you guys a little bit more about. Um, what else? Um, so this is our vision. It's a, it's a lofty vision. Our vision is to transform marketing through the application of technology and math. And that sounds pretty high level and pretty vague. Um, but I would say that the thing that we're trying to do is to take the first, the quote that I showed you, the John Wanamaker quote, and after 100 years, we're still trying to do that. And what we've seen that, um, as our CEO likes to say, math men have replaced mad men. Um, that is a trend that continues to happen, and we're using technology and math to enable that trend to happen, to, um, to enable our customers to measure the effectiveness their, of their advertising, to use the enormous amounts of data uh, and interesting signal to drive better outcomes for them, to not be annoying. How many of you guys have been annoyed in the last year about ads that you've seen online? Come on, I know some of you have. Okay, thank you. It's okay. Our job is to figure out how to evolve our industry beyond that. The internet is here, the internet is here partly because advertising enables it to be free. Um, and so our job as a company is to try to solve that and enable, that's kind of the higher mission, is to enable us to do that, to continue to do that in a way that it doesn't irritate consumers. Um, and I think we've um, seen a lot of really interesting innovation over the last 10 years, and the next 10 years are gonna be also interesting. So if that's our, if that's our vision, our mission is to enable marketers to have engaging one-to-one -one interactions with their best audiences across all touch points where those audiences are to drive actual business outcomes. And as you guys know, you have your phones, your tablets, you have your smartwatches maybe. Um, you are going about your day and you're trying to figure out how to get your, how to live your life. Um, and marketers are trying to figure out the best way to engage with you in a way that is helpful, uh, that is not hurtful, uh, that is in interesting and relevant and personalized, but not annoying. Who's seen, um, is it Vanilla Sky or Minority Report? Now I'm all, for, all forgetting. I think it was my Minority Report. Anyway, has anybody seen Minority Report? One guy in the back. All right, it's a great movie if you guys haven't seen it, but it, in it, it's sort of this dystopian future. This guy walks into a mall and this thing says, John Anderson, welcome. Would you like a discount on eyeglasses or whatever? And it's kind of creepy. And so our job is to figure out how to have engaging, useful, interesting interactions with people. And it's really, it yields really, really interesting um, problems. The place that we want to sit ultimately, if you think about our mission as a company, is 
in every major enterprise, in every major business, there are a bunch of different functions. You guys know about this already. Sales, finance, procurement, IT, human resources, and software platforms have cropped up to help them solve problems. Uh, Workday is a hugely successful public company for HR. Um, Salesforce, you guys have all heard of, obviously, is an amazing end-to-end -end tool for sales. Media Math, this is our ambition, is to be the system of record for the CMO. And that requires that we do a lot of things really effectively. Why do we want to do this? Um, I talked through some of this stuff already, but really it's also because um, the CMO actually controls an enormous amount of tech decisions and budget, more and more. And the relationship between what the CMO, the chief marketing officer, is doing and their, their tech department and their own technology is increasingly intertwined. And so it's our job to really help them bridge that gap. So all that sounds great. What is it that we actually do? Um, because this is probably the first time you guys have been exposed to some of these terms. So I'm gonna try to break it down into some actual concrete examples you can walk away thinking about. One is, we get asked this all the time. I, as a customer, want to know how much to pay to put an ad in front of my users, and my, my customers. How, to, how much should I pay for the right to show somebody an ad? That's a hard problem to solve. It involves understanding the predicted future actions of that person. It, it involves understanding their lifetime value for the advertiser. And so there's a lot of really interesting inputs, decisions, and outputs that trigger the actual ad or message that we show to a user. That's something that Will and I work on every day. Two, I just want to tell you what I'm trying to achieve and have you figure out how to optimize towards it. So more and more, we're trying to get to the place where we say, OK, if they just want to get, uh, make sure that if they have $100 million of ad budget and they're trying to launch a new line of uh, self-driving cars, that um, that $100 million of budget will result in more car sales than the actual money they spent. Because that's the only reason why a CEO will give their CMO money is because they want to grow their business. Um, so our job is to deeply understand the outcome that our clients are trying to hit. So let's call it a three to one return on the money they spend and let our system figure out how to get it for them so that they don't have to keep doing a bunch of micromanaging. And the good news is the technology enables us to do that. We actually have a lot of great um, uh, uh, success on that front. Is this interesting to you guys? Okay. Um, help me in increase the lifetime value of my most loyal customers without annoying them. That's a big one. Um, and lifetime value is really important. It's a hard thing to understand. So if you're an Uber, who's used Uber in the last six months? Is that something you guys, okay. Yeah, lot, oh wow. Um, so Uber is like really interesting. So there's one thing to get, here's an objective. Uber wants you to download their app. I think most of us have already done that. Uber wants you to open up their app and to take your first ride. Okay, it sounds like most of you have done that. Uber wants to make sure that you continue to use Uber regularly. How do they do that in a way that isn't like every morning they say, you know, Jacob, don't forget to order your Uber. It, like, it could be really annoying. Um, but that's their job is to understand how much each of you guys um, are worth to them and then make their marketing decisions based on that in real time at scale. That's hard. That's a hard problem to solve. I just want to create an experience that engages usefully with a user as they consider a major pur purchase like a car. So what that means is that as you go, um, I don't know if you guys are, this is the, the wrong group um, because you all live in the city. I, I don't know, you, probably most of you don't have a car. I don't have a car. I haven't had a car in like 20 years. But if you were to purchase a car, it's a long consideration cycle. Usually, for most people, you take a couple months, you do some research, you talk to your friends, you talk to your, maybe you talk to your spouse or your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and you think like, what is it that I'm trying to do? Who do we want to be? And in the course of that research, the consideration cycle, going to the dealership, dealing with the dealership, deciding I want to use it, get a, buy a Tesla car, not, there's no Tesla deal. All that stuff, advertisers want to make sure they're there helping guide you through that process because obviously they want you to choose their product. So that's a very hard thing because you're traversing a lot of time, a lot of different environments, a lot of touch points, your phone, a website, you're watching a late night infomercial on cars, they don't, they don't have this. And then finally, I want to understand the value of my marketing. Is it working? That is the most, I think, the most common question that we get. Is it working? Prove to me that it's working. I just spent $5 million to 
launch a new service, um, or Uber did a big branding campaign because they're trying to mitigate the effects of their CEO resigning or being fired, um, or something else, um, we need to uh, help them understand how the, what is the impact of the advertising that they're making? And so understanding that, is it driving a sale? Is it an app download? Is it increasing the brand uh, affinity of the audience that sees it? Those are hard problems to solve uh, quantitatively via technology and also explaining it to an audience, like a group of marketers who are not, we don't require them to be deep technical experts. Um, so we have to translate back what our technology does in plain language so that they can understand if they're being successful. So those are some of the problems that we, we, we try to solve. So we've done this for 10 years. Um, and I don't expect you guys to look through this and understand all of these terms. I would be surprised if you do. Sometimes some of us don't understand all of them. But there are a lot of things that we've done. MediaMath has established itself as an innovator in this space for a decade. And it's an interesting decade. It's a decade where advertising has become more and more digital. Digital advertising has become more and more programmatic or addressable, where when you advertise online, you can actually have personalized interactions with users. And so we're seeing that as the major trend that is not stopping. In fact, it's accelerating. Um, and so we're very, we're very proud of this. And we're preparing for the next 10 years. So this is like the, the real talk version of my, my bit. We have a lot of work to do. We've grown up a lot over the last 10 years. But there are some really big things that are still on the horizon for us. I'm presenting these as interesting challenges for us to solve that involve a heavy dose of technology. So one is marketers are shifting all of their budget, their traditional budget, into digital. Why? Because you guys are online all the time. Um, you, where your attention is, where your eyeballs are, whether you're playing a video game or looking at your phone or whatever, that's where your attention is. Um, even advertisers who traditionally just looked at doing big Super Bowl spots, um, they are experimenting with ways to engage with you during the Super Bowl, if that's something you like, um, in a way that's a lot more personalized and that they can understand what the impact of that 30-second commercial was. Those things cost a lot of money. Um, and so they are shifting budget into digital. Um, uh, that is also accelerated by folks like Amazon, who um, have created digital, a digital storefront that you can buy anything you want there. Who's bought something on Amazon in the last week? Not everybody, probably. Maybe not everybody. So P&G, uh, again, Procter & Gamble, one of the largest advertisers on the planet, is uh, a great example of this. And if you Google Mark Pritchard, who's the chief branding officer at P&G, he has a very clear thought platform where he sort of laid out, hey guys, I want to move all of my, dig uh, all of my marketing into digital, because I know that's where people are, but I need some assurances. Um, I need to know that it is safe. I need to know that it is fraud free. I need to know that when I show an ad online that people are actually viewing it. And those are legitimate and very important um, requests that he's making. And so the bar is getting ever higher as advertising becomes digital and as digital advertising becomes programmatic. It's on us to make sure that we can accommodate the biggest um, and most visible marketers on the planet and their needs. So that's an interesting set of problems to solve. How do we create, in a kind of decentralized environment like the internet, a safe and um, measurable experience for a customer like P&G? Two is fraud is a big problem. Who's thought about this? Has anybody thought about this? <laughs> Will has thought about this. Some people have thought about it. It's a big problem. There are a lot, maybe some of you guys, I don't even know how hard it is to do this. You could probably spin up a fraud business at NYU. This is a terrible suggestion. Don't do it. Um, don't do it. Uh, but it's a big problem, and it's very uh, difficult to mitigate without active dynamic management. So this is a real example of a client who the, the red is, uh, is high likelihood of fraudulent traffic. The light blue is we're not sure. And the blue is people who we know are humans. And what does that mean? It means that um, when a website loads, if it's an actual human looking at an ad, that's good. Um, if the website loads and it's unclear if it's a bot that's generating the traffic, then that is bad, obviously. Um, and it's a big problem. And there's no easy way to solve this problem with one solution. It's a multi-dimensional solution that requires 
really, really precise measurement, a deep understanding of the problem, probably an inspection of the infrastructure on which we built our current experience, uh, the internet, um, and, um, and a lot more visibility. But I would say in the next couple of years, this stuff is really gonna come to a head. Uh, but it's, it's definitely causing a lot of um, strife. And there are some really interesting and innovative things that we at MediaMath are doing and that a lot of startups are doing in the industry to solve this problem. And then finally, I would just say another thing to highlight to you is consumers demand, uh, we have to take consumer rights and advocacy really seriously as an industry. We've had the luxury over 10 years of being self-regulated. Um, but if you've ever been followed around the internet by ads, you've opted out, you've maybe opted out of being tracked by those ads by clearing your cookies or by doing an opt out. Um, there's not necessarily an overarching way to do that. And with your identity on the internet being a fragmented experience, who you are on your cell phone versus your laptop is oftentimes unknown. That linkage between those two things is unknown to an advertiser. Um, it's difficult to de-identify you. And th these are areas that we really need to lean in on. Um, and there are big, big um, global regulatory bodies that are looking at better ways to protect consumers. Uh, and we are very, very intent on helping them do that. So these are three of the interesting problems that we're solving. Other things that we're looking at, so I talked about, and this is my last, second to last slide, and then I'll hand it over to my colleague, Will. Um, we, we've been tackling these problems, uh, supply chain quality and fraud, I talked about that a bit. Uh, consumer advocacy is big for us. Identity management is really interesting. An advertiser doesn't want to market to a device, they want to market to you. And so how do they do that? Um, linking devices together is one way. From their standpoint, it's a really interesting and important objective. From your standpoint, it's a question of, as a consumer, like, how does that make me feel? It probably makes you feel bad if the only thing that they do is identify you. It might make you feel a little bit better knowing that if they can identify you, then they can de-identify you. And the, the, the message there is, if you're able to opt out as a person across to, to make sure that no one's tracking you across all your devices, that's really important. So identity management is really, a, is really an important thing. Um, and it's just going to get more, uh, it's going to become more of a complex problem over the years because uh, today you have a phone, on average they said people have six devices, there's six devices per person. I don't really know what devices they're measuring, uh, but that number is supposed to explode to double, triple that amount with Internet of Things and set-top boxes and Rokus and Apple TVs, et cetera. So the idea of identity and how advertisers are messaging you or over-messaging you, that's a really important topic that as an industry we're trying to solve responsibly. Um, I don't know if anybody here cares about user experience. Anybody? A couple? Okay, cool. It's, this is a really exciting thing for me personally. Um, I think we're in a stage where our clients, so think of them as users in our platform are trying to solve some of the problems that I articulated in a couple slides ago. Um, they are doing that in a B2B console on a desktop. They're also flipping up their phone and checking Instagram and looking at Snapchat and checking the weather and doing all these things. The idea that those two experiences are different in kind is bizarre, right? There's a definite integrated thought that we need to do to rethink how users interact with a platform like MediaMath that incorporates a lot of really interesting things like messages, push, push notifications, but also really smart recommendations from perhaps a, a deep machine learning AI that wakes up in the morning, w w sorry, you wake up in the morning, it never sleeps, and it tells you, um, hey, here are the things that you should be doing today. Um, and that enables us to have a lot more interesting conversations with our clients. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, advertising agencies as partners, uh, this is just gonna be a major trend. Uh, these advertising agencies, Omnicom, Publicis, IPG, et cetera, control an enormous amount of budget, and they're trying to figure out where to focus their business uh, with Google, Amazon, Oracle, uh, IBM, all sort of entering the fray as next generation advertising solutions. And so how do we help them? What is it that their differentiation is gonna be in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Um, those are interesting things I think about because I think about what products could we co-create with them? How could we give them an amazing, robust platform that they could build on top of? Um, and those are areas that uh, Will and I are super passionate about. Um, cool. Uh, so 
Transforming messaging, I think this, is, this one's near and dear to my heart because it's actually the thing that you see from the marketer. A lot of times you think of those as banner ads, um, but there's a lot of different ways to have a personalized interaction with a consumer. Customizing the content you see on a page based on your preferences. Um, creating ways to interact with a text uh, chat bot. Um, what, what was the other? We had a whole brainstorm yesterday about like really interesting ways that we can uh, increase the variety and sophistication of the messages that we can actually show consumers. That's super interesting. So those are some of the things I think about. Before I hand it over to Will, I just want to outline the thing that I get excited about, which is that we have a lot of work to do, but the market is huge. So today, 2015, which is two years ago now, um, you know, total worldwide digital spend was 160 billion. Um, in 2018, total, the total advertising market, total addressable market, is about a trillion dollars. All advertising, $650 billion. And then the worldwide digital spend is 231. We expect that to grow to about 300 and change by um, 2020. So the market is there. It's growing. There's a huge opportunity to do this the right way. And we at MediaMath firmly believe that technology will enable us to lead, to lead the way there. And hopefully some of the things that I shared today sort of outline that. And then finally, 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 is um, we, you know, we do have a lot of fun. So I just wanted to show you the team. This is our Halloween party. Yeah, we had fun. I won't tell you who I was in this. But Steve, who couldn't be here today, was the German inflatable man next to Godzilla. Um, this is our, uh, we have a big MediaMath.org. We have a big philanthropic uh, part of our group. Am I stealing any of your thunder, Megan? OK, good. Um, so we have, we have fun. We do good stuff. Um, we uh, are international. This is our Brazil team. Um, we have a great team in Singapore, uh, in Tokyo, et cetera. But we do a lot of stuff internationally. We have a big presence there. Also, our clients are global. So we've had to service them um, in a lot of different ways. So there's really interesting nuances to each market uh, that are really interesting to learn. And the commonalities there are interesting, too. And we also work really hard. Um, so this is a group of very studious media math people. I think this was all at Halloween. Um, but uh, we definitely have a super collaborative culture of work. Um, and so on that note, um, I'll hand this off to my colleague, Will. So hold on. No, go back. What is that one? That's also a knife? I think it's it an looks like a knife. axe. Axe? No, no. Axe it's handle? A, it's like a cleaver. So this one went straight through, and this one's just kind of stuck in there. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Jacob. Yeah, sure. That was super important. I know. I had to get that out of the way. Um, so uh, my name is Will Showberry. I'm the CTO. I've been here for five, 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 yeah, five years. Um, and I came through an acquisition, which is always super fun, and acquisitions go perfectly, and nothing ever goes wrong. Uh, <laughs> not true. Um, super awesome, though. It's like this, it's this weird thing when you get like two cultures that are totally different, and you mash them together and say, let's go do stuff together. And there's like no awkwardness or weirdness. I came in through that process. And so my um, experience here has been, I think, pretty awesome. I've been able to see, um, you know, as Jacob mentioned, like uh, the, the some of the 15 different offices. I've been, uh, you know, jumped between, I think, four or five different roles uh, in my time here. And uh, I've experienced the change that I think Jacob talks a lot about. And so uh, thank you, Jacob, for like actually giving, setting the stage in the context. Um, uh, my role as the CTO, and I know you guys have probably heard from a number of different um, technical leaders, and every company's like, uh, CTO is, plays a little bit of a different role, right? And so um, at a company that has uh, a large amount of uh, both technical and strategic change, but also is a technology company, typically what the CTO will do during that time frame is actually guide the long-term technical and product direction, right? So um, you know, I partner very closely with Jacob to figure out what are the capabilities of technology that uh, are actually possible today, and how do we use those capabilities to inform the product strategy and the business strategy, right? So um, we, are, we are partners in that way. We work together on the long-term technical strategy, and I help to um, uh, Jacob and his team kind of figure out ways to leverage technology more effectively in uh, the products and the offerings that they provide. Um, and so, you know, we talked a lot about change. I think Jacob talked a lot about change, but um, as you guys know, like technology is, it is change. Like it is, I, I think of technology as um, a conduit to change, but also itself always changing. And so since I've been here, um, and these numbers may be a little bit off, um, but you know, I joined, I think, uh, roughly employee number 110 or so. Uh, this is back in like December of 2012. And now we're in the 800s, right? Um, 
at the time there were maybe 40 total in product engineering and now there's almost 300 soon, right? Um, we had, I think at the time, roughly 500,000 requests per second in uh, nine data centers. And now we're doing uh, this, this one particular cluster is now making decisions on the order of magnitude of over five million requests per second in eight data centers. So yes, we did lose one, but that was for really good reasons. <laughs> um, and then, you know, at the time, I think we were operating and processing on uh, terabytes of exhaust, right? Exhaust being like the, the output of the work that happens, the stuff that we make available to our clients, the things that we learn on. Um, now that is petabytes per week, not just uh, uh, terabytes per week. Um, you know, I think the, the <coughs> standard back then was everything was relatively batch and batch-based processing was uh, a more economic way to, um, uh, you know, learn and make decisions uh, and, and, and effectively run the machine learning processes. Now we do a lot of the stuff in a real time in a streaming format, right? So the underlying technologies have drastically changed there as well. Um, ooh, I have to ask, okay. How many of you guys are more, like when you, when you leave school and go um, find a job, are more interested in front-end development? User interfaces, user experience. One, wow, all right, cool. Uh, two, back-end development, server-side, okay. Um, what about, I feel like it's roughly a half. Um, I'm gonna put this in air quotes, big data. Okay, almost all the same people. <laughs> Uh, data science, almost all the same people. Cool, um, great. So you know, I think then we had roughly three-ish or so products um, that were either ML-based or infused machine learning. Um, now it's in the dozens, um, and and that's a really big um, you know growth point for us. Um, and then I guess maybe the more funny one uh, for me is like you know a lot of our code then was in Perl. Uh, I assume that's probably not a language you guys are spending too much time learning these days. Um, and uh, uh, you know, our front end was, was developed in, uh, well, actually before Backbone it was um, Flex. Flash, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, now it's, you know, the, the focus is a lot more uh, oriented around things like Go um, and React, and we have a big contingent of folks that are using uh, Scala, specifically Spark, um, and, and obviously, you know, C++ as the kind of mainstay of our uh, lowest level real-time transaction processing, that stuff is still there as well. Um, so, you know, all of that uh, growth and all that change and what the technology actually makes possible um, means that we, like, we have to just be on our toes, right? We have to be willing to reinvent ourselves um, every four or five years. And it's not actually just that the tech is changing, it's also that um, the industry is changing, right? So Jacob talked a little bit about this, but um, you know, our customers are getting more and more sophisticated, right? There was a point in time where the only thing that they ever did was call us to make changes. Like they were just managed service clients because that was easiest. And then they were like, okay, we actually have to use the product. And now they're building, they have data science teams. They want to build their own algorithms. They want to bake those things into our processes, right? And so, you know, that is, a totally different modality of actually inter inter uh, interacting with their customers, right? Um, and so they have basically come to expect different things as the um, as our business has grown, right? And so now, you know, um, they expect reliability, right? They expect very high levels of reliability because they're building technology on top of our technology, right? Um, and they expect uh, co-developed roadmaps, right? So they, every single one of these clients, like you know, Jacob mentioned PNG, largest advertiser in the world, um, they want a custom roadmap just for them. And so do the next 10, right? And so that's like, cool, we, we need to be able to customize uh, and we need to be able to do that super quickly, right? So this is the other thing in ad tech. Um, there's a slide uh, that, oh, I should have put this in here, but like it's called the Lumascape. I don't know if you guys have ever heard that, but it's basically like, there's like, logos that are this big and it would fill the whole screen. And it's like thousands of companies in our space that do like 100 of them do the exact same thing, right? And so um, a lot of those companies are gone, right? They like venture capital makes it easy, venture capital and the cloud make it really easy for them to stand up, to get into business, but then they don't last because there's no like really good market for them. So the idea of being like ad tech and marketing, like the industry is very cutthroat, right? If we don't like, rapidly change the way that we operate and constantly like rebuild and do the next thing, then we're basically gonna be left behind. Um, and then, you know, the role that we pay, play in the industry, it actually requires us to be scale leaders, right? So a lot of the stuff that um, Jacob was talking about 
um, those different ways to talk to consumers, to um, have a conversation with them, each of those things at the lowest level, um, technically, can actually be represented and abstracted as a decision, right? And so if we're talking about having conversations in real time with billions of people, that requires us to be able to handle decisions in real time on the order of billions of people, right? You have to have technology that actually can scale to those um, uh, amount of touch points and those amount of de decisions. So um, if you're keeping score, um, what I basically just said is we have to develop it faster and more reliably, and we have to support customization and do that at internet scale. So those are kind of super contradictory, right? You could probably easily do one of them at the expense of the others, but um, we're, we're in this position where we have to figure out how to do um, all at the same time. Um, so they are contradictory, but um, not if you actually have the correct um, technical approach and strategy that actually supports that, right? So um, when we started the company, um, back in uh, 2007, um, it was largely a managed services business, right? So an advertiser called us, we had some code. The code did the work, but the advertiser called us and like some person uh, in our office basically like fiddled with some things and then it did the thing. Um, and so like the, the, the thing that did the thing, it was like, you know, duct tape and Band-Aid like holding it together, and that's cool. Like that's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with a startup. You know, everyone, like if you've ever been in like a project that's just getting started, like of course your code's not great. You're just trying to get it, get off the ground. Um, so nobody cares as long as the campaigns are actually performing. Um, but then we like, we actually transformed ourselves into a product company, right? So the difference here being that instead of calling us, they're logging into user, user interface, right? And so that thing is, um, it's, it was a great, interesting transition because technically we had to go from duct tape and string and bubble gum to a polished product that was highly reliable and performant and actually gave people the confidence to put $5 million a month in, right? Like if you're, if you're in the process of actually putting $5 million into a UI for, you know, per month, you probably want that thing to be great. You don't want that thing to, you know, be like an Excel hack, right? Um, and so um, then I guess like some, somewhere between 2013 and 2015, it depends on who you ask um, at Media Math, like we actually started to transform ourselves again, right? And so this was moving from like a product oriented business to a platform business, right? And so um, I love tech platforms, like platform as a strategy. Does anyone here subscribe to Stratechery? There's a really good podcast called Stratechery, Stratechery. Um, and it's like, I think it's a podcast. It's either a podcast or an email. Um, and it's awesome. Like they basically talk through every single like major internet company and major like tech company out there. Like the moves that they make in context of like a tech strategy and an overall strategy. And so like platforms are really, really interesting to me because they unleash a lot of raw power, right? And so if you are, if you're using a user interface, you're forced to do what the UI enables you to do, right? So the thinker, the person who de designed that user experience, they had a very specific experience in mind, and you can use the underlying functionality exactly how that thing was intended to be used, but you can't do really anything else, right? Now, if I turn that around and I give you a bunch of APIs, oh, things get exciting, right? If I build that functionality in the most general possible way, then you can write whatever you want, and I have no idea how you're using it. I might have never thought of that use case. Right? And so this is what, like, what the transition that we've been going on over the last um, four to two years, depending on who you ask, um, like what that, that's basically been the direction that we've been going. Right? And um, the great thing about having that sort of platform approach is that it actually allows us to do those things that we said before. If I am actively um, taking every single um, component in my system and making it API first, making it modular, making it composable and self-serve. Um, I'm letting anyone build whatever they want on top of it. My customer could be you. It could be the developer down the row from me in World Trade Center who works at MediaMath. And that's great, right? That's awesome because we're not talking in the con uh, construct of emails and um, uh, you know, JIRA tickets or whatever uh, tracking function you use. We're talking the construct of APIs. The way that we communicate is over APIs. And um, yeah, that's... I think that's really exciting to me. Um, and that's actually just, just the beginning for us, right? We've been going down the API front. We have um, 
you know, a lot of, uh, you have a, a relatively robust developer portal that explains a lot of stuff that's going on. But part of the platformization for us is um, it takes actually investing in the bottom up, right? And so one of the things that we've spent a lot of time thinking about is um, how can I commoditize myself, right? Um, and so let, let, me, let me see if I can unpack that. Um, I have functionality that I might really rely on. Um, if I want to scale the business, I want to take that functionality and I want to make it as, um, uh, as commoditized as possible so that those things, more people can start using that. They can use that on a self-service basis. And actually, that thing can scale itself out. And when it scales itself out, there's a nice little benefit here to economies of scale, right? The cost of running that service goes down, which means the products that are built on top of them, they actually become cheaper to run, right? The margins go up. The, um, products become more profitable, and that's, you know, that's that's a really important thing for a business that's you know, uh, startup and growing and uh, you know, um, continuing to become more profitable. Um, and so, you know, here's the things that you know from a bottom up that we're spending a lot of time thinking about right now. Um, and obviously, this list is ever changing, and it's certainly not complete. But I wanted to spend some time on it um, with you guys, and um, you know, I understand there'll be some Q and A later, so feel free to um, dig in here or otherwise. But um, the first one is uh, <coughs> this idea of infrastructure as a service, right? And so, um, does everyone have an a Amazon Web Services account or a Google Cloud account? Awesome. So um, we have eight data centers. Um, we also use a lot of cloud. Um, and the trick here for us is that. Um, we have now two targets. If I'm deploying into a data center, my experience as a developer is actually a lot different than if I'm de deploying into um, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud, right? And that's bad, right? Because that means if I'm a developer, I have to focus on a lot of boilerplate to get my thing into um, a physical server. Uh, and probably also the same if I'm doing it in cloud. It's just different boilerplate now. So now I have like this effort to go through on either side where um, that code is actually not reusable. It's not componentized. It's not like benefiting anyone else, right? We like to reuse. We like to not repeat ourselves. Um, and so that's one that we've like, we've looked really hard at containerization and we are basically going through the effort of re-architecting our entire um, physical cloud and network topology so that I can take the same particular piece of code and I can run it without thinking too much about where it runs and uh, the underlying resource either in the cloud or in uh, on-premise environment, right? I don't have to worry about it. The networking just works. The um, uh, service discovery is there. Uh, all of the connections will kind of fit nicely. It doesn't matter if I'm here or there. And I can do this at 100 gigabits per second. Like, that's the hard problem. It's not just doing, like, running a cluster here, running a cluster here, running a cluster here. It's like these nodes that are doing the computation actually do it at very, very high speeds and low latencies. And that's something that isn't necessarily like a solved problem in uh, the container networking, like, you know, virtual networking space. Um, so that's one, one really important thing. One of the reasons I get excited about that one is, you know, our, because we um, engage in the, um, basically like the regular diurnal cycle of the web, right? I mean, maybe you guys are different, but most people aren't constantly online at 2 a.m., right? So we see like this, I don't know, it's, I was in college too, it's cool. Like there's this 11 p.m., 10 p.m. is when things start to dip down. Right? And so if I have like 5,000 servers and eight data centers and I have like 70% of my compute in that time frame is like wasted, right? Like what am, I, what am I gonna do with all those CPUs and all that memory? Like I could probably use them. I could avoid buying an extra 3,000 servers to do stuff with that existing capacity, right? So that's something that like, hey, that's, that's great. That's great for the business. It's a really interesting and a hard problem. Um, and it's something that, you know, we think will save our developers a lot of time. Um, Similarly, like, you know, if you go a level up, so you kind of notice this theme of I build this thing over here and I build on top of it with the next thing up, right? And so this, the level up is, you know, um, how do I take that same class of like common problems? What are the things that every service, every product, every, you know, piece of uh, tech needs? You need, uh, I'm just going to spitball this list. Let's see, you need service discovery, you need alerting, you need monitoring, you need metrics, you need uh, centralized logging, you need authentication authorization, you need all those things represent something that someone at Media Math, like in the engineering team, owns, right? And so like each one of those things are actually a product, but if I'm building a service and I have to embed every single one of those things before I can even go to production, then 
that's also an awful experience, right? Why don't we take all those things, package them neatly into a SDK where I say like, you know, uh, Heroku up sort of thing, and it just gives me my Go package and it has all those things baked in, and I don't have to think about it. Like, that's something that we've spent a lot of time um, thinking about lately. Um, the, the next one is like unifying our data pipelines. So uh, what exactly <laughs> does this mean? Um, so has anyone played with Kafka or similar messaging buses, message queues? Firehose, Kinesis Firehose. No, okay. So a lot of what we do is, it's funny, there's like a running joke. Um, it's a running joke in our data platform team that like media math is actually just a data company. We happen to apply said thing against marketing. Um, and their motto is, um, it's like data platform, uh, moving gibberish at high speed. Because they actually don't care what the data is. They just care about you know, doing this all the time super, super effectively um, and efficiently. And so what we've been doing is we've been saying, you know, I mentioned earlier that everything, every engagement that we do is basically a decision, right? It's an opportunity to make a decision. So if I'm taking a second to you know, uh, make a decision on a piece of input data, then what I'm actually saying is I need to take this piece of input data, whether it's in a real-time signal form or a batch form, or I'm getting it from server to server, or I'm getting it from a browser, doesn't really matter. I need to normalize it into this package, into you know, a well-understood schema-based, maybe Avro-based sort of format, and I shove it into Kafka, right? And then Kafka basically transfers that thing to anyone who's downstream and interesting to uh, interested in consuming it, right? And so there's this, like this pub sub pipeline behind all of it that actually has this kind of um, interesting quality about it that I can do, I can do enrichments. I can task a, uh, tack a little bolt onto the end of it that says, for every single piece of data, I wanna enrich it with like a GOIP lookup. I wanna enrich it with uh, um, whatever, like weather, right? I, every, any particular thing I can have like bolt on like little different sequences where my data pipeline ends up just looking like a set of step functions. Sorry, I don't mean to project, projectile spit on you. Um, but everything kind of just looks like one of these enrichments that kind of goes down the pile and then I can do super clever things like I can migrate streams together. I can do, um, you know, attribution where I say, take the last event from here and take the last event from here and merge them together and then someone else can consume it. And all these things eventually they make them their, uh, their way into like a Spark uh, uh, based, you know, streaming cluster somewhere or they go into S3 or they go um, into a big, uh, you know, batch data warehouse for processing somewhere. But all these things, you know, we, we, we have this uh, on the order of peg petabytes a day. And so the, pro the actual effort of moving this stuff over is a hard problem. Like you, to, to be able to do that and guarantee delivery order and guarantee, um, who's here into distributed systems? So like distributed systems, like that we, we happen to be on the tail end of the largest distributed system, lossy distributed system in the world, which is the internet. Right? Like, is Comcast big in New York? Yeah? Is it Time Warner? You guys have the internet outage like from two days ago? Maybe? Anyone run it? No? Okay. NYU internet is great. Cool. Um, so like that's, like that's something that like we think a lot about is like how, how can we ensure that the, the high value data that's moving from uh, the New York data center to the Chicago data center um, actually gets there, gets there on time, gets there quickly, gets there um, without dropping data so that you know, the quality service levels are super high. Because at the end of the day, this is the data that we get paid on, right? Like, if it doesn't get there, then we owe someone else a bunch of money and we didn't get paid for it, so that's bad, right? Business constraints. Um, and then the last one um, is, uh, you know, we, I know I'm not the only one saying this, but like ML, and AI, they're eating the world. Um, and so the thing that we spend, we have been spending a lot of time lately, um, and you know, as you guys know, like our uh, motto is uh, transforming marketing through the application of technology and math, and our company is called Media Math, so like we've always been super into math and machine learning. Um, but the challenge for us uh, this year and this coming year will be to say, okay, cool, we've had this research and development arm, like Prasad Chalasani, who has you know, a couple amazing papers out there on like incrementality uh, measurement and logistic regression-based uh, optimization. Like, those things are super interesting, and they've been historically done as like an, a research and development unit. But how do we take that thinking and take that capability and actually make it a core product of every single product team? Right, where I could say, 
you know, product folks and engineers, we don't necessarily always think about the things that machine learning could make possible, right? We don't know all of the ways that it could make our product more effective or make it scale better or make it more efficient or um, uh, whatever, right? Um, and so how can we actually take that capability of machine learning and embed that into, sorry, am I going over? Ooh, I am going over. A little bit? All right. Um, <laughs> um, so, so like, how do like how do we do that? How do we embed that into into every part of the product, right? Um, and make those folks like, um, uh, you know, work very closely with the tech leads, but also work very closely with the product leads to help them kind of inform the way that the product direction goes. Um, but the really the toughest thing for us as the company has grown the most is is actually focus uh, uh, focusing on culture, right? So Jacob and I care a lot about culture. We spend a lot of time talking about um, you know things like. Uh, Conway's law and organizational models and you know we the stuff that keeps us at night like don't get me wrong I love the tech challenges more than anything and like don't tell anyone but I kind of hate people like myself included so like it's not actually that enjoyable to deal with people problems all day long but the reality like is that like you like me yeah. oh you like people I like you you like me thanks man <laughs> um, so like no but like really like how, like how do I you know I came my startup was 20 people so how do I keep that startup vibe going here at media math at 800 right you guys seen that like there's that um diagram where it's like if your team has three people then there's like two connections that you have to maintain right but like as you grow to like 15 people it's like way more connections and at some point like the dunbar number kicks in and you're just kind of hosed right and so like how so like how do we do that how do we keep the pace up how do we keep the pace of development um uh quick as we're growing like how do we encourage people to try and fail like failing and learning is super important. Like how do we, you know, even things as simple as like have a proof of concept step in your development cycle where you say, I have a couple things I will learn and two weeks, no more than two weeks. I have to learn as much as I can about these, this problem in two weeks before I can actually write a single line of production code, right? Like stuff like that, like hacks like that are super, super important. Um, and, and those are things that we, I think uh, Jake and I spend, and Steve, um, who's not here, spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, but really, like, I guess maybe what I'm trying to say is that we, like, we love hard problems. Um, we don't shy away from them. Like, we don't <coughs> avoid them. Um, our industry and the scale that we're at, um, they necessitate actively, like, diving into hard problems. Um, and so that's why I'm here five years in, not going anywhere, love this place. Um, and, you know, a lot of interesting problems. So if you're interested in any of them, uh, you know, we're hiring. <laughs> uh, so feel free to reach out to any of the uh, four or five of us that are here today. Thanks, guys. Thank you, okay. Thank you Jacob and Will. Um, so right now, we're going to have a 15-minute Q&A session. I'm sure during their presentations, you guys had some questions. I know I did also. Um, but sit tight, because Brian, who is uh, college recruitment manager, all the way in the back, um, will talk to you a little bit about internship and full-time opportunities that uh, the company has, as well as you know the company culture and, and where that fits in. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Will or Jacob? So, um, okay, so one of the things, the question was, how are you using serverless technologies in our current platform? So one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about in that um, unified data pipeline is the steps that I was talking about, those like things like enrichments and so forth, those can effectively be modeled as Lambda functions, right? Where uh, you don't really care um, what the scaling model is for that particular unit of work, because that's basically what it is. But as long as it's sitting there listening on a queue, if there's not like a tight latency bound, there's no reason for it to just listen on the queue and asynchronously f um, push the thing out. Um, so as part of our production platform, we don't actually have any Lambda yet, but as part of the process of developing out that unified like data pipeline, um, the Lambda-like functionality, serverless-like functionality is like super important. Because again, I, I don't actually find there to be much value in the effort of you know, scaling these effectively stateless pieces of work that can um, go and come based on like the time of day. Uh, so in the back, we actually have a mic if you want to step up to it. 
or if you can project, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, you said that uh, uh, media map is like uh, uh, getting into machine learning and uh, AI. So for LLP, what you have been doing so far? Like it has been more than five years. So sure. Um, so uh, full disclosure, I'm actually not the expert on this topic. So I think it would be awesome to get uh, you know our chief scientist in to, to spend some time like giving a talk uh, in more depth about this, but um, you know, I think we have had some form of L ML in play for probably the last eight years or so. Um, and uh, there were a number of different uh, you know, approaches that, again, I can't speak to quite well back then that were effectively um, had some form of a tree-based output, like PML-like output, which was um, effectively embedded into each of our decisioning layers. Um, right now, we have um, a lot of logistic regression currently in play. Uh, we're doing a lot of experimentation with things like uh, Word2Vec um, and a lot of, uh, I think, kind of inference detection through those vector-based um, uh, approaches, I guess I should say. Um, and then I believe, um, I'm trying to remember the actual approach that they use for the incrementality measurement. Um, but there's, there's been a lot of, I think, maybe even in the last nine months, a big shift to uh, the deep learning-like set of approaches, especially since it's been a lot easier to uh, get access to large quantities of GPU-based compute um, in, uh, in the cloud. And so those guys have, uh, I think, a really strong partnership with a, a couple of the um, vendors in the space that effectively allow you to leverage um, both uh, Spark on the GPU, but also um, uh, I believe there was like an internal um, bake off between Torch and um, TensorFlow. Um, and I think they've landed on Torch, which I know is an interesting decision, but we haven't totally decided which way to go there. I think that the most interesting part of this problem to me, and Prasad would certainly disagree with me on this, but um, the act of actually taking these models and productionizing them, like the DevOps of machine learning, if you will, that problem doesn't seem to be solved to me, right? And one of the things that we care a lot about is as we deploy products, um, they should be comp that process should be completely seamless to customers, right? And so we should be able to slowly blue-green or you know, uh, shift traffic over to these new models and measure the effectiveness over time, right? Using holdout groups and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's one of the things that um, in the kind of this hybrid environment that we have doesn't seem like a particularly fil facilitated process yet, which is one that we've had to you know, begin writing scaffolding around to make it a little bit more easy. I hope that answers your question. Do you want me to take the first half of that? Sure. Yeah. All right. You get the first 10 questions, I'll take the second 10 questions. Cool. <laughs> awesome. So I don't know if I can actually repeat the entire question, so I'm just going to go with answering it. So um, the way that I like to explain this is um, if I'm Gap, um, I'm ultimately interested in selling a shirt or a suit or something, right? And uh, my, the the goals that I'm metriced on as the CMO, as the marketing officer, um, are how can I drive sales, how can I get people in, and how can I drive sales of the product, right? So there was a point in time in the past where people cared about clicks or just people coming to the website. Not anymore, like people actually want to show that the money that I spent um, results in products being sold. Um, and thanks to technology, this is a relatively easy thing to measure, or it has become more and more easy to measure. Um, and so, uh, the reality, though, is for some reason, our market has like really complicated this process, 
So um, I'm a big sports fan, so I'm going to use ESPN. When I go to ESPN.com, there's this kind of slot on the left for an advertisement, right? And that thing is a real-time auction. It happens 5 million times a second, and it has, we have 40 milliseconds to do that. Right now, Gap isn't our only customer. So what we have to do is we have to say, given this particular opportunity, and given all of their budgets and all the products that they've sold, is it worth it to Gap for us to spend some money on this particular ad slot? And so this, uh, in order for that ad slot to drive a particular purchase. Right? So there's, there's effectively like a, a full loop optimization process that says, when I buy this ad for $5 as opposed to $1 as opposed to $0.10, cents, like, is it going to be more effective or less effective at driving that purchase? But because each of these ad transactions happens on the order of like a hundredth of a penny, this ends up being a really, really big problem because like I have to optimize all the time to this particular outcome. So our product effectively makes it super easy for the marketer to go in and say, I want to sell 1,000 shirts or I want to drive $10,000 worth of, or $10 million worth of outcomes of sales. Um, and I'm willing to spend $1,000 on it and do the magic for me. <laughs> and that's how that kind of whole process. Um, so the user journeys part is. Hmm. It doesn't sit on top of Google's ad crawler. Um, it does, we do interact with exchanges, um, which are very similar to financial exchanges. There are probably more than 100 exchanges out there. Um, Google does have one of those, but we don't leverage any of Google's technology for the act of actually placing the ads or like deciding what to show. Um, we just use them as basically like a clearinghouse. Uh, so we actually have time for one more question. Um, all right, perfect. Uh, since uh, you just briefly mentioned about you know, the users and impacts on uh, your solution, so I'm not just restricting my question to this certain user, but how would you consider best search engine optimization and those kind of solutions? Uh, like, do, do you kind of really consider those, or is it just the uh, data that you're more interested in? Like, de de definitely. You want to take this? You want me to? Go for it. So um, we think of search as like yet another way to get in front of the customer, um, and so it is yet another way to engage with them. And to the extent that we have integrations with them, we would leverage that to actually engage with the customer. Um, as of right now, search is not a part of the Media Math platform, um, and one of the reasons behind that, like the, just the business realities behind it, is it's it's a thing that's been around for so long and the margins for it are so low and there are established players and there's, it doesn't make a ton of sense for us today to offer that. But obviously like as part of a larger solution, it certainly makes sense. Um, it's just, you know, as a, as, a, as a business with constraints and roadmaps, like you have to prioritize based on the impact of what your building is going to have to your customer. All right. Thank you, Will and Jacob. You um, so I'm going to introduce the floor to Brian who is again the college recruitment manager. Um, also, at the end of his presentation, there'll be time for questions. Uh, he's talking about internships and full-time opportunities, so I'm sure there'll be tons of questions after he speaks. Uh, so just hold on for those. All right, awesome, thank you, awesome. Brian. Thank you. So as you heard today, we are number one DSP, demand side platform, number one, I'm sorry, not number one, number three, DMP, data management platform and continuously on the cutting edge of innovating our platform and making sure that it's always sort of like up to date and working as fast as possible. But what is behind all of this? It's people. So obviously this is where I come in. So out of everyone here, who is looking for like a summer internship? Raise your hand. Cool. Who's looking for a full-time job in December or May? Yes? Awesome, awesome. We have like a third opportunity that I could explain a little bit more. So we have just over 650 people over eight countries. Um, and as Will said in the last statement, like culture is something that's very big for us. So a little bit on our culture is we are, have a very collaborative culture. 
and we're a very flat organization. And I know everybody probably heard that, flat organization. Like, what does that mean? I know it took me a while to understand, like, what is flat? But if you're an individual and you're in a company, let's say you have an idea that has a business case and can be implemented and affect the business in a real way, instead of, like, most other companies will take that idea and sort of give it to a more senior person, you'll be able to sort of drive that innovation, drive that idea, build it out, scale it, what have you. So we're very big and collaborative in that sense, in that we're not really taking your ideas from you and sort of implement it, we're having you drive that. Right? So this culture continues over every single office. And as you said, we have grown quite a bit. And he's gone from a team of 10 to a team of, what, 100? So pretty, pretty big stuff. So our summer internship that we are hiring for runs from June to August of the summer. So that will be for anybody who is either like a rising senior um, or anyone really just in school still. For our full-time opportunities, we have full-time opportunities in our tech space, business space, and operations space. So if you're looking for any of those, we're absolutely looking for that as well. Um, some cool points around like what we're doing while our culture and stuff like that. Um, we rated best company to work for, and as of this morning, built in New York, ranked as number 25 um, for best tech companies to work for. Um, so my speech is very, very short, but <laughs> if you are interested in joining like such a great team that's always sort of on the cutting edge of new technology and sort of innovating and making sure that we are always on whatever the next digital platform is or what have you is in advertising, definitely feel free to chat with me after this event and apply online. All right, cool. Any questions for me? Yes. What can I do to be competitive in the coming years? So when I apply for um, the summer internship, I'd be competitive. Will I you know, get a, a little bit of a back? Awesome, awesome. So how can you be competitive? What's really big for us, like especially when you're in the space and competing against a whole bunch of other students, is making sure that you're working on the right projects. So you'll be working on a lot of projects within your class and within your courses, and those are cool, but it's only really impressive for the first person that comes and say like, oh, you work this project, but by the 50th person, it's like, oh, so everybody in your school worked on this project. So really being able to do things outside of that coursework and making sure you include that in there and making sure that you are interning and learning new things. And if you're interested, I saw a couple people interested in databases, definitely going out there because there are free databases online and digging into that, learning how that works and building out your own databases. And the final part of it is being able to sell yourself. Um, a lot of people I talk to are so like, oh, I've done this, this, and this. Um, but to me, that means nothing. What you have to say is like, what exactly was your role in it? Make sure you can really clearly define what your role in that project is. What you, like, I, I say, always say, okay, what was the purpose of the project, right? Um, what was your role in it? What was the challenges that you had to face? And how did you overcome that? So if you're able to clearly articulate that in a project that not everybody has done, that's how you become more, I don't know, you could probably I, um, I like the combination of like something that demonstrates um, the combination of theoretical understanding and practical application. So um, to the extent that you can provide even like just a GitHub account that shows that you um, implemented something uh, interesting, complex, whatever, um, we, and I love, but I think this is not unusual, uh, in tech anymore, um, but we really do love like a GitHub account with open source projects in it as a signal for these are the things that I've played with before, hey, this is what my code looks like, um, and I have a good grasp of the theoretical things that go behind uh, the problem I'm solving, but also the practical, um, what's the phrase, uh, craft, right? To some extent software engineering is actually craft, and so like the ability to demonstrate um, the practice of it um, is, I think, the most, uh, probably one of the most interesting things for us to look at as like hiring managers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you are interviewing people for full-time jobs, mm -hmm. um, what are your expectations from the students who are coming in? Expectation in as so, so like uh, with respect to tech stack that you just mentioned, like using Go, using Spark and 
than uh, C++. So do you want us to be familiar with the, those particular that particular stack or you're open to multiple languages, multiple um, So I'd be, the question was, uh, is there a focus on a specific tech stack when it comes to uh, you know, the hiring process for us. I think um, we, you know, I'd be lying to say that we didn't prefer uh, people with previous experience in our tech stack, but more important than that, I think, is um, a, like, demonstrated hunger and desire to learn and, uh, again, like, theoretical and practical experience in the stuff that is not the tech stack, right? So, like, if you can demonstrate an interest and maybe effort against the types of things that we're doing, but it's in a totally different language, in a different operating system, that's fine, as long as you're interested in, you know, learning the new thing, right? Again, like learning and growth and like trying new things is really important to us, and so, um, you know, it, I think the, the, sort of like the premise is like you bring someone new onto the team, you kind of don't expect them to be useful as a contributor for the first six months, because they have to learn every, you know, idiosyncrasy about the stack and, like, the development process and the architecture behind it um, and the, you know, personal dynam dynamics of everyone on the team. So that's a good period of time to basically learn the thing that you'll be in because you have to do it anyway. Yeah, and it definitely speaks to, like, our culture as well. Like, we have a culture of learning. So always continuous thing to learn. Um, we even have an arm of our business, NMI, new um, marketing institute, which is just an educational arm within our business, not only for external partners, but partners within people within the company. Um, a cool thing about that as well, like if you came into our business and knew a new language or a new tech that we have not experienced with and you said, you know, I would love to teach other people, they'll definitely put that in place to have you sort of teach that to other individuals as well as learn other cool things that other people know in the company as well. And um, uh, what is the interview process like? For full time? Yeah. So for full time, it's depending on where you meet me. Um, if you apply online, you're applying online, you have a phone call with one of us. Um, you would then be reviewed by one of the hiring managers, have a technical exam. If you pass that, then you go into the on-site and meet with the team. So super straightforward. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so on a high level, um, our interns, when they are working here at Media Math, are working on real life projects. So we're not giving you anything theoretical, you're working on actual problems, um, trying to solve something. Because uh, what's really important is that you serve as fresh eyes. So you have people here who have been, might have been looking at the same problem for a very long time, and then you come in and have like a fresh idea and look at it from a different perspective than we might have looked at it. Um, so yeah, so you'd be working on real life projects, not like uh, anything theoretical. So something that look great on your resume as well. I think that's what you. Yeah, yeah you'll, you'll be part of the process of delivering whatever they're delivering, and be paired with a mentor type person. Um, at the end of the day, like you know, we we think of internships not as like um, you know someone to help us go get coffee. It's more of like um, a bi-directional sort of exchange of thoughts and ideas where like we're investing in you because we want you to come work for us after you're, you've graduated, right? And so um, the best way to do that, I think, is to provide practical experience in the types of things that you'd be doing, um, you know, once you've graduated. Um, I like to see, like when I'm, when I'm looking for, I like to see basic coding skills. Like if you, I mean you can't come in and not know how to code anything, but if you have like C++, um, I see a lot of people who have Java. Um, is there anything that's specific to you that you? What, I, I'm enjoying this line of questions around the languages. What, what are you guys um, learning in? Python. Python? Java? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, there are teams um, that do some Python stuff. Um, Media 
Yeah, so the, again, like there's, there, are, there are, on the data science side, I think there are more opportunities to do Python. Um, you know, Java, it's a JVM language, so assuming that you have interest and desire to play with Scala, like there's a lot of teams that do Scala-based stuff here. Uh, yeah, given the duration, like it is certainly more practical that, you know, people have, um, um, you know, close up uh, experience there. But again, like if you have um, a real strong desire to spend time learning X, um, then like that's, that's, I think, ultimately a stronger signal than um, language experience. Yes? Yeah, so um, we have, sorry, this is probably better for you to answer, um, but we have uh, uh, product management roles of many different senior seniorities. Um, we, I was just gonna keep going. No, just thank you. I, we agreed I would wear the collared shirt today and Will would wear the tech guy shirt. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> how many open roles do we have? Like. 65, so we're, we're gonna, and, and that's like always on, so we have a lot of roles. Right now, I'm investing a ton in product management, in UX, uh, where we have a lot of different interesting specialties around people who are really passionate about understanding user research, um, uh, actual UX um, prototypers, um, so there's a lot of cool stuff around there. I know that's not of interest for everybody, but I think that's uh, super interesting. We're hiring a ton uh, around data science and definitely around software engineering. So there's, I'd say across the board, there are a ton of opportunities. And the cool thing about some of the programs you guys have in your little one sheet is that we also have a program called the MET program, which I think Brian is gonna speak about it, so I won't, I won't give it away, but that's also a great way to get exposed to a lot of different pieces of the business um, and a super, uh, it's a really nice way for a lot of people right out of school to join a class-like environment to be in a corporate, you know, in corporate world, even though we're not really that corporate-y. Um, in that program, I'll just, I, well, I, <laughs> I was a taco in football, I did not catch anything. <laughs> I just hit people. Um, <laughs> so the MET program, the Marketing Engineering Program, a misleading name, but pretty much what it is is a accelerator where you would come into, um, media math and learn programmatic, right? So most of you here have a technical background, so what it would more so breach for you is um, taking that technical piece that you have and then bringing in like sort of marketing piece and understanding that, f a full understanding of what programmatic is. Um, also in this program, similar to our internship program and anything that you do, you're working on a real life problem. Um, fortunately for us, this past cohort, it was like a problem that we were having. Um, and it's like, how do we drive more traffic into the MET program because the name is sort of misleading. Um, people are like, because we do everything across the board. It's sort of like a program to get you in there, understand programmatic, and not necessarily when you come in do you have to come out the same track, but it helps you get that foot in the door. Um, so they had a chance to actually use T1 in order to target their appropriate people and their appropriate markets and appropriate schools in order to apply. And then we saw like an increase of I don't even know, like maybe 300% in applicants. Um, so it's very cool. So you get to actually work on that and see everything. Sorry, I keep slapping it. <laughs> cool. Any other questions around hiring, how to make yourself more marketable, what not to put on your resume, how to talk in person, like anything? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So. Also two ways, depending on how you meet me. Being that I already visited NYU, um, unless you visit me next spring, um, is you would have a conversation with me, whether on campus or a member of our team on campus. After that point, you would be sent in for MEP or intern? Which one are you talking about? Tech, Tech intern? Yes. So you'd be then sent to the hiring manager or the team to review to sort of say, like, where would this person's best fit be within our organization, unless you apply to a role directly? Um, after that point, you would have the technical exam in person if that's passed, and then that's it. So, yeah. So, the only difference in like you meet me or anyone that we go on campus is that you're skipping the phone call with me because you already had this conversation with me and going directly into process. Um, for MEP, the process is quite similar to on campus, as most people will meet on campus, is you have a conversation with me, 
and then you'll go into a sort of cognitive exam, so version of a technical exam to see like where you stand, uh, followed by a video interview because of volume. And then you have a phone screen with the hiring manager and come on site. So that one tends to move a little bit faster because it's just like, because share volume, we have to like get through people a lot faster, but it's also an excellent program to be in um, if you want to get your foot into the door for a programmatic. Yes. Oh, I've never <laughs> taken it, so I <laughs> uh, Have you taken the technical exam well ever? Have you looked at it? No, yeah. I can say, are, you know, I can say um, technical challenges are different for different types of roles, of course, um, but they are all, again, practical assessments. So an example of something that you would actually be doing or a problem that you're actually trying to solve um, to give you a sense of the work that you, know, you would actually be doing and um, how you would solve a real, a real problem. So I would say the time commitment for our challenges is no less than an hour, no more than three hours. Yeah, we'll let us know. Yeah, so if anybody's interested in any role that we spoke about right now or sort of any role that's listed on our job board, I strongly recommend you to apply online and then when it says how you heard about us, to select that you were at the NYU Tandon Tech Talk. and. Uh, that would be able to expedite you. It's like, okay, I remember these students and they know a little bit more <laughs> about what we do. Um, yeah, and that'd be the best way or just meet me on campus, all right? And at the bottom of that email, if you ever just need a little bit more feedback or have any more questions that you want answered, just shoot us an email there at the bottom at globaltalentacquisition um, at mediamath.com. All right, awesome, cool. So thank you to all of our media math representatives. Uh, we actually have some Tandon gifts for you to thank you for coming out as a token of our appreciation. Um, are they here? Oh, ah, here they are, okay. So we have some backpacks for you. Um, <laughs> I guess all four of you. Here you go. Thank you so much. Um, Do you guys have these? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right, uh, so thank you for coming out. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I'm sure they're gonna stay for a couple extra minutes if you have any questions for them, um, or if you just wanna talk one-on-one. -on -one. So thank you. Thank you.